Hello, friends. Thank you so much for joining us. We're very excited. My name is Dr. Jillian Skelton. I'll let the committee members introduce themselves. Go ahead. If it is uh, as you go on oh. this part. I'm going to mute some of you, please. Let's see here. I'm done. Dr. Daniela Bianchi Lops, and I've worked with Raj both in class and now on his committee. So I'm excited to be here with him today. And I'm Dr. Ron Rizzo, and I also had the pleasure of having Raj in class and have enjoyed working with him on this uh, final step, this milestone of his of his work. So I look forward to hearing from him and uh, talking to you today, Raj. And I'm Dr. Jillian Skelton. I am his chair. I've been working with him extensively for quite some time now. So we are very excited to welcome you all to this oral defense. At this point, um, the process and procedures are as such. I make Raj the host, and we are already recording, so he will give his presentation. At the end of his presentation, we all have to um, put you guys in a waiting room, and then we have a very intense question and answer period of time having to do with his content. At that point, we then put him in the waiting room, and then we discuss the outcome. At that point, um, we bring everybody back, and we give our, we deliberate. Okay, let me let this person in. All right. So if you are put in a waiting room, please, you can wait there patiently, and um, it will be a little while, but we will bring everybody back in a little bit later. But as of right now, Raj, I'm going to make you host, and I'm going to say, take it away. One of the things we do ask for everybody is um, we try to make sure that everybody puts their, um, turns off their video and turns off their audio, mutes themselves for his presentation. We have had technical difficulties in the past, and we don't want that for Raj. So we're not going to allow anything to distract from his presentation, which he has been working years on. So with that said and done, Raj, you can share screen and take it away. But unmute yourself first. <laughs> can you see my screen? It's perfect. Perfect. Awesome. So good morning, everyone. My name is Yuvraj Verma, and I am going to be sharing my doctoral dissertation with all of you. It's titled The Impact of Self-Efficacy on Urban Elementary School Teachers' Abilities to Identify and Deal with Fallout Amongst Their Students Caused by the COVID-19 Pandemic. So the agenda for today is going to be as follows. We're going to start off with the lit review, and we're specifically going to talk about the gap pertaining to the study. Then we're going to go into the problem and the purpose of the study. Then we're going to talk about the theoretical framework that this study was guided by. Then we'll go into the research questions. Then we'll go into the methodology. And then we'll finally get into the meat and potatoes, where we'll talk about the results of my study, as well as we'll go into the discussion. So as we all know, back in December of 2009, the coronavirus started spreading in Wuhan, China. And on February 12, 2020, the World Health Organization had officially named it COVID-19. So initially, children weren't um, impacted by COVID-19 at first, like I said, in terms of symptomology. But then in March of 2020, students were affected and because over 90% of students worldwide had to put their education on hold due to quarantining. And to this day, young children are experiencing fallout from the pandemic. Um, right after the pandemic kind of sort of ended, students were quarantining as cohorts and as individuals. This year in particular, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, experts are stating that the flu has been much worse. And um, so, like, medically, we've had a lot of challenges, but also academically, we've seen a lot of issues with students where the learning loss is definitely profound. And even though, you know, today is December 1st, 2022, we have one more month until we're in um, January of 2023, and the impacts are still continuing, even though we're almost like three and a half to four years after the COVID-19 pandemic. So teachers, as we know from common sense, but also the literature supports that they're in a strong position to observe how the impacts manifest amongst their students because children spend most of their time in school. But what's very interesting is that the literature states teachers aren't aware of their role in identifying and addressing the needs of students who experience any type of fallout. There's really scant research about that topic. And as you can see from the citations, that's not something that's new. That's actually a gap that's been 
researched and has continued to be researched since 2012, in 2016, and in 2018, all before the COVID-19 pandemic. But that gap is still seen in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. It's even more profound and it's even more visible right now. And we know that the impacts of COVID-19 are going to be lasting indefinitely. Like to provide a little bit of more context, currently third graders who are um, in third grade right now, they were kindergartners when we had to quarantine. And the um, current students in 12th grade were freshmen in high school. They were in ninth grade when they had to quarantine. So the two years after, which would be first and second grade for third graders and um, 10th and 11th, 10th and 11th grade for the freshmen really um, was, you know, a combination of in person when schools were opened up as cohorts, but it was predominantly online. So we really need to know how teachers perceive fallout amongst their students. And that is especially true in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. And that leads us to the problem and purpose of my study today. And it states, I'll read to you, the problem of this study is that it is not known how the self-efficacy, performance outcomes, and vicarious experiences um, of urban elementary school teachers impacts their perceived ability to identify and deal with fallout amongst their students as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. And the purpose of this study is to understand how the self-efficacy, specifically performance outcomes and vicarious experiences of urban elementary school teachers impacts their perceived ability to identify and deal with fallout amongst their students as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, when I was reading my problem and purpose statement, I did bring up the term self-efficacy. So that's the theoretical framework that guided my study. And um, self-efficacy pretty much has to do with how an individual believes in his or her ability to execute a task. Um, it was created by Albert Bandura back in 1986 as part of his social cognitive, uh, he was a social cognitive psychologist. And essentially what self-efficacy means is if an individual has low self-efficacy, that means they lack confidence in their capacity to complete a task. And in contrast, if they have a high self-efficacy, that means they're very confident in their capacity and their ability to do whatever it is that they would like to do. And that doesn't necessarily mean that they are correct. Like if they believe that they're not good at something, that doesn't and that doesn't actually mean they're not able to do it. So self-efficacy and reality may not necessarily be correlated with one another. And there's four factors that um, are related to self-efficacy and that impact um, self-efficacy. The first one is performance outcomes, and that amounts to past successes means that you're going to be more competent at completing a task. So if you previously did something and you did great at it, most likely your self-efficacy is going to be high when you complete that task moving forward. <clears throat> and then we also have vicarious experiences, which is another um, factor. And that has to do with when you observe someone else and if that person was successful or not successful, that might impact your belief in executing that task. And specifically in the arena of education, a lot of student teachers or mentees or veteran um, teachers who get guidance from veteran teachers, their self-efficacy can either be high or low based on what they see from their superiors, from you know their student teacher, like their collaborative teacher or their mentors. Um, and the two factors that I'm not going to be focusing on in this study, but they are factors of self-efficacy, are verbal persuasion, which has to do with whether an individual is encouraged or discouraged to do something. And the physiological feedback is the fourth factor, which has to do with like our bodily reactions to certain tasks and if th how that impacts us from having a high or low self-efficacy. So the research questions for this study are as follows. Number one, how does the self-efficacy performance outcomes of urban elementary school teachers impact their perceived ability to identify and deal with fallout amongst their students as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic? And the second question is similar to the first, but it's how does the self-efficacy vicarious experiences of urban elementary school teachers impact their perceived ability to identify and deal with fallout amongst their students as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. So the methodology that I use in this study is what I'll be talking about next. I decided to use a qualitative design because qualitative researchers know that the world isn't stable and it's really based on perspective. So we really want to understand a phenomena that's occurring as qualitative researchers versus quantitative researchers who want to like 
they want to find measurable or countable results. They ask questions like how much or how many. Um, so of the different types of qualitative designs, I decided to work on, I decided to use descriptive phenomenology because that is a process, a design that really understands the lived experiences of your participants. And then the sample and population was a total of six participants. And I used a purpose of sampling process where I chose the teachers from grades. Well, I didn't choose. I had the assistant principal um, assist in choosing teachers from grades K to six. And I had one teacher from um, every grade except for second grade. But I still had a total of six participants. And they were all elementary school teachers. And they were all urban elementary school teachers, to be even more specific. Um, the instruments and data collection. So I had a questionnaire that I employed to all of the participants before I even interviewed them to kind of just get a baseline of who's who and um, to also compare and contrast later on. And then I conducted semi-structured interviews with all my participants via Zoom. They consisted of divergent questions, which weren't open-ended. So that was like the collateral information, like how long have you been teaching? Um, what grade do you teach? And then I had convergent questions, which were open-ended about their experience, especially related to this research work that I'm doing. Um, and before I even spoke to the participants, I spoke with some other teachers and educators that I knew, and I kind of um, provided them with a copy of both the questionnaire and I conducted the semi-structured interviews. So that way, when I conducted it with these six participants, um, any kinks or issues could have been addressed beforehand in terms of like wording and timing and things of that nature. And before I even started the research, I um, made sure that the like ethical considerations were taken into consideration. So I received IRB approval from my university, William Howard Taft University, on February 11th, 2022. All participants received an informed consent before we even conducted the research. So um, they had the opportunity to read a little bit about what the research is about. And they were notified that if at any point they felt any type of mental health anguish, they could stop the interview process as well as the questionnaire. And that would be totally fine and acceptable. And um, for the protection of all the participants, they were provided with pseudonyms. And that also helped like build rapport and make them feel a little bit calm um, when they had to like make up a fun name to be called throughout the interview. And um, like I said, I used a Google form for the questionnaire and I conducted semi-structured interviews via Zoom. And then I analyzed those two points of data using the Van Com approach, which consists of five steps. Number one was bracketing, where I listened and I transcribed to all the interviews that I conducted. Number two, I isolated specific phrases to code them. And then ultimately from codes, I went to categories. And then three, um, step three was creating themes based on those categories. Step four was finding, making sure the themes were aligned to the data. And then step five, I was defining themes by taking direct quotes from the six participants so that the themes and what the participants said did indeed match. Um, in terms of trustworthiness, I use, same, I use the same set of questions for all participants, both via the questionnaire and when I conducted the semi-structured interview. So every single participant was essentially asked the same set of questions. I had a total of five subject area experts review my uh, research instruments. So the five that review them have experience in K-12 education, as well as post-secondary work, like they were professors in colleges and universities. They taught across North America and some, um, one of them taught in South America as well. Their experience ranged from five years all the way to 28 years. And all of the five subject area experts had at least five, uh, at least a master's degree. And one of them has a PhD and one of them is working on her EDD. Um, and in order to make sure that this research is replicable, I made sure that I used best practices, all of which were aligned to the research. And one thing that I received feedback on from one of my committee members, Dr. Rizzo, was to make sure that I minimize researcher bias because I am an elementary school teacher and um, we all have our own experiences. So what, some of the ways I did that was minimizing any type of facial ex expressions when the participants would inform me of information or when they were answering questions. I made sure that I wasn't judgmental. Even when I asked follow-up questions, I made sure that I worded it in such a way that I wasn't being judgmental or rude or anything like that. And I made sure um, 
that I didn't have any themes in mind. Because like I said, even though this is an area that there's a gap in, there were still some studies done. And quite frankly, a lot of the themes tended to overlap and they were similar in nature. So I really had to make sure that like, I didn't think to myself, like, let me try to pull out quotes and pull out information where the themes are going to be what I had previously read in past research. And quite frankly, when we get to the themes um, in a couple more slides, you'll see that these themes are totally different than like themes from past research that I had um, like reviewed in my literature re review. Um, so in terms of the results, before I go into like a lot of the heavy details, we'll get a chance to know who the participants were. So there were six urban elementary school K-6 teachers that I used in Utah. And they were all females, which is not surprising at all because K-12 education has been a female-dominated profession for decades. Um, it was a good, vast amount of participants because they were mixed in terms of their career stages. There were some teachers who went from high school into college to become teachers, and some who became teachers through ARL, which is the alternative route to licensing. Um, their years of experiences range from three years all the way to 19 years. And some of them actually taught, obviously, before the 2019-2020 school year, which was the COVID-19 pandemic school year. Some taught during that school year, so they started the year, quote-unquote, normally, and then they quarantined. And some actually started teaching in 2020, which is the 2020 to 2021 school year, which was post-COVID. So we really had a great, um, vast amount of um uh, experiences from people who taught before COVID, who taught when the pandemic happened and quarantining happened, as well as post-quarantining. Um, and like I said before, I had a teacher from every grade from K to six, except for second. And some of the teachers were loopers, meaning they stayed with the same class for multiple years pre-COVID, as well as during COVID and post-COVID. And some of them, like one of the teachers, the fourth grade teacher had the set of students she had um, in fourth grade when they were in second grade before COVID and until, you know, the pandemic and the quarantining happened. So she knew kind of who her high, mediums, and lows were, which I'll talk a little bit about later on. Um, so those perspectives were also very helpful throughout this process. So like I said, initially I provided those six participants <clears throat> questionnaires and they um, were asked questions regarding their ability and their skills to identify students that were affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. So for, um, there were several questions, but these were some of the um, questions that I thought were interesting that I'm going to share. So four of the six had a high degree of confidence in identifying students that were affected by the pandemic. But then two of them changed their level of confidence in addressing students affected. And the two um, that had a lower, a relatively lower uh, degree of confidence were also newer to the field. So they were able to identify the students impacted, but in terms of dealing with them and addressing them, that's where their confidence decreased. And like I'm going to talk about later, that's because there was a lack of standard in what, how does it look when you address a student who has been impacted by the pandemic and who experienced some type of fallout. So it's because, like I'm going to explain later, there is no standard. That's where a lot of the teachers were unsure that if their hard work was successful or, or if it was not. Um, there was also a mix in teachers' confidence in addressing future students that they had who were impacted by the pandemic because the fallout and the different impacts really were um, different from student to student. Some students had academic challenges. Some students had challenges related to social-emotional learning. So there, there was really a mix. And the knowledge and skills needed, there was a mix in terms of what the teachers felt was needed and what was not needed because, like I said, the lack of a standard. So after um, conducting all of the interviews, I had the opportunity to transcribe all of them, which took um, a good bit of time. And I also learned that it's very annoying to hear my voice for hours and hours. But what I did is I conducted an inductive thematic analysis where I used the data to generate a theory as opposed to conducting a deductive thematic analysis where like, it's kind of like a top-down approach where you want to analyze the data um, by applying a theory. So because I was trying to understand a phenomena and I was conducting more of like a qualitative, um, a descriptive phenomenology um, methodology, that's why I used the inductive thematic analysis. So the first part involved coding, um, where I basically reviewed all of the um, quotations. So, so pretty much this is how it looked. I had reviewed all of the data and I've reviewed all of the transcripts. 
and I found quotes that were related to a specific idea. So some of the ideas you'll see are parent connection, student connection and empathy, and poor self-performance. And what I did is I asked myself, did multiple people say a specific idea? And I also asked myself, did one person say that idea um, multiple times? And if both of those questions were true, that, what, that idea then became a code. So um, like I said, I, made, I asked myself two questions and that was my decision rule. Did multiple people say an idea? And did one person say that multiple idea multiple times? And if both of those were true, that automatically became a code. And I did that for a total of four times. The first two times I did that, I was getting new codes. Then the last two times I did that, um, I was not getting any new codes. I was not tagging new codes and I was not um, reviewing prior codes. And I received a total of 17 codes. Then, once I had those 17 codes, what I did is I created categories. So I combined the 17 codes into categories by asking myself, are they related to self-efficacy or not? And I wasn't looking at all four factors. I was only looking at performance outcomes and vicarious experiences. So once those 17 codes became six categories, I then um, went into the next part, which is creating themes. And I combined the categories, the six categories, if there were pathways to the concept of self-efficacy, and I looked for patterns between categories that are related to self-efficacy. And what ended up happening is those six codes, it was actually pretty um, easy. There were two um, categories per theme for a total of three themes. So I went from codes, I got 17 codes, then I, from codes I went to categories, I got six categories, and those six categories then yielded three themes. And the three themes that I um, like got from the study were improving performance via creating and maintaining connections, develop experience, developing experience via learning, and confidence to assist via resources. And I'm going to talk about all of these themes throughout the discussion question, but I really wanted to um, talk about how the themes relate to the two research questions. So a little bit deja vu, my first research question was how does the self-efficacy performance outcomes of urban elementary school teachers impact their, ability, their perceived ability to identify and deal with fallout amongst their students as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic? So the two categories that the, um, the first theme was comprised of is engagement and monitoring performance. And in this context, performance was monitored continuously. It wasn't just through formal measures like tests or teacher evaluations. Um, and the teachers really explained how the performance manifested through engagement, both as individuals, like teachers were monitoring themselves, and collectively, like with parents, with colleagues, with administration, and collaboratively when they had meetings with one another. And throughout the interviews, the teachers really distinguished their own efforts of trying to identify and address students who were impacted by the pandemic from the effects. And like I said before, because there was a lack of standard, a lot of the teachers felt that, yeah, they're able to perform and they're able to identify and address students who were um, impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. Their confidence and their self-efficacy was high for that part, but it was low when it came to actually um, talking about the effect because different students have different ways, like there's different ways of dealing with students. And post COVID-19, a lot of the teachers expressed frustration that we still are using pre COVID-19 standards to measure student success. And oftentimes we've realized like this is the pre COVID-19 standard and students are still down here. That's what they were um, articulating during interviews. So, and that, also had to do not just academically, but also social emotionally, because a lot of times teachers are realizing that these sixth graders were in third and fourth grade back when COVID-19 first started and quarantining started. So a lot of their behaviors were atypical for sixth grade. But then when they kind of took a step back and realized, oh, okay, this is, these are third and fourth graders, they kind of realized that like they did, they did the best they could, but the effects may not have been what they wanted to for a sixth grade student because they had the mindset of a third and fourth grade student. And then the last two themes are related, to, uh, or they answered the second research question, which was how does the self-efficacy vicarious experiences of urban elementary school teachers impact their perceived ability to identify and deal with fallout amongst their students as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic? 
So the first um, theme, developing experience via learning, was comprised of the categories collaborative learning and experiential learning. So all educators know and um, research supports that in theory, education is collaborative. And in this study site, education absolutely was collaborative. A lot of the participants explained from the top, from the admin, all the way down to even their aides in the classroom, they all collaborated in some way, um, in some form or another, not just at meetings, but even during the day. Like one of the participants said that it wasn't abnormal for students to see teachers in the classroom at any given time during the day because they have such a collaborative um, like environment at the school. But in the context of COVID-19 pandemic, what was, uh, what was happening is the participants were saying that they experienced an event and they either learned from it themselves, but where they actually learned more was when their colleagues experienced an event and they had to collaboratively come together with their administrators, with parents, with people from the special education department. And through that collaboration, they solved the issues. So when other teachers experienced similar challenges or fallout, then they would speak to their colleagues and those colleagues would share their experience and how they were confident in addressing it. And they would tell their colleague what to do. And teachers felt more confident addressing challenges when their colleague who experienced something similar would now be able to um, address the challenge. Um, and experience and learning is an integrated uh, process. That's what a lot of the participants articulated. And new teachers actually talked about how they learn more from collaborating than from their own experience. And that is pretty much the essence of vicarious experiences. When they spoke to their fellow colleagues or administrators or members of the special education department, they felt a lot more confident in dealing with or addressing some type of fallout that they were experiencing. And they also talked about how grade changes was beneficial, like collaborating after, you know, if the teacher was used to second grade and now they're in sixth grade, they felt more confident now that they were able to uh, speak to their fellow sixth grade teachers. So developing experience via learning was not only learning that was occurring from the individual teachers, but it was the collaborative learning that they um, felt was very beneficial. And then the last theme is confidence to assist via resources. And that was comprised of the two categories, resources and organizational process. So when we think of resources, we might think of like physical. That is true. Sometimes fit like um, the resources were like technology, but then sometimes there were non-tangible items like parent support and time. And this entire study site, the participants really articulated that they had a very negative level of confidence, not because that they were unsure of what to do and how to address and identify students who were going through some type of fallout, but because there was no standard on how we address and identify students who were impacted because of the COVID-19 pandemic. So you could have a student who's academically low because they have a learning disability or they had a traumatic brain injury, but what do we do or what is the right standard when a student is academically low because of the COVID-19 pandemic? That standard to this day does not exist according to research that I've attempted to locate. Similarly, social emotionally, students might be acting a certain way because of loss in their life or trauma or so many other reasons. And the challenge that teachers had is they didn't really know what's the proper standard or what's the proper procedures when a student's impacted because of the COVID-19 pandemic. So the resources were really minimal in terms of what do we do now um, because there was no standard. And a lot of the teachers, you know, they were able to accomplish tasks. They were able to delegate tasks when they had a challenge. But then what they ended up doing is they just simply accepted that it's impossible because there's no standard, and that contributed to their low self-efficacy. Um, but they did know that they were all in the same boat, and I know I'm repeating myself, but that is very important for this theme, is that there was no standard on what the outcome or the effect needs to be. So that was the entire study and the uh, results, but the study also had numerous limitations. One of them was the sample size. I had only six participants from one urban elementary school, but like I said, I wasn't um, only conducting a qualitative study, I was conducting a descriptive phenomenology. And for descriptive phenomenology, six um, participants, you know, is totally okay. 
because the goal of um, qualitative research is not to widely generalize the findings, but to really understand a specific context. And in this context, it was the study site that I used. I didn't really incorporate a lot of diverse settings. I only focused on urban elementary school teachers in one school, as opposed to rural and suburban schools. And we know that those two types of settings have their own set of factors that might lead to different types of results. Um, the interview durations, so for descriptive phenomenology, they should be occurring across several days and occurring for multiple hours. I was only able to conduct one interview with each participant that lasted between 30 and 45 minutes. And that was still sufficient, like, for, you know, data saturation and, you know, figuring out enough um, information to conduct my analysis. But if anything, I feel that was totally okay because it's related to the context. A lot of the teachers expressed how this year was a very taxing year, how they were very tired, and they were very candid and frank about that. And I think the fact that the interviews did not last as long as, quote unquote, they should have, I think that was not a bad thing. That actually kind of amplifies the context and the difficulties the teachers, the participants were going through. Um, so that is not a negative. If anything, the silver lining is it kind of gave more insight into the um, research setting. And then I also only used two of the self-efficacy components. I didn't use all four. So none of my research, um, like, answered the other two factors of self-efficacy. So, um, and that's because the questions, the questionnaire questions and the uh, semi-structured interview questions didn't um, pertain to the other two. So the recommendations that I have for the future, I have both theoretical and practical recommendations. Theoretically, um, we can also look at how technology has changed students' lives in K-12 as well as higher education and how students are reacting to the change as well as the continued changes. Because before COVID-19, schools did kind of push to use technology, but when the pandemic occurred and the quarantining occurred, schools were forced to use technology and teachers were forced to use technology. So that change and that continued change where a lot of districts and a lot of schools, according to the research, are forcing technology integration in the classroom is something that can occur as a case study or in um, another descriptive phenomenological study. Um, the diverse settings, like I said, how does the questions and the problem and purpose for my study in this um, research, how would that apply and how would that look in a rural or suburban school setting? Um, is the self-efficacy high or low because the level of resources the parental engagement might be different. So that's one thing um, that can occur moving forward. And practically speaking, for professional development, all schools should be implementing some type of professional development to benefit teachers, not only academically, but social emotionally. And pre-service teachers, like undergrad teachers or teachers who go through like alternative licensing routes, should um, learn about education technology because all schools at this point, in some form or another, they are trying to integrate technology as much as they can. And collaborative learning should always occur in PLCs, which stands for professional learning communities. Um, but a lot of times schools and districts tend to only focus on academics, but based on the you know mental health epidemic that we noticed occurred because of the COVID-19 pandemic, we should also um, incorporate professional development and collaborative learning and professional learning communities pertaining to social emotional learning as well. Um, so before I go on to the Q&A section, I just wanted to acknowledge several people. Um, I didn't name everyone because then the text would have been very small on this slide. So what I will do, what I did is I just kind of copied and pasted the parts that generalizes everyone. So I'm going to read to you all. The formation and the skills and the, the formation of the skills and the drive necessary to earn my doctor of education degree started before I became a doctoral student as well as while I was a doctoral student. As such, I'm thankful to those who have helped, inspired, motivated, supported, and or positively impacted me as a person, student, and or educator. Thank you to my dissertation committee. Thank you to my friends, well-wishers, former and current colleagues and supervisors, classmates, professors, etc. And my dissertation committee, Dr. Skelton, your enthusiasm and excitement for doing something that's so time-consuming and, um, no offense, boring, was definitely very, um, you know, helpful. And Dr. Rizzo, you know, you always, like, would give me, like, some heavy feedback 
compared to all my committee members. But then you would give me like 50 good things I did, even though, you know, you gave me one or two things that I needed to fix up that were pretty heavy. And, you know, Dr. Bianchi Laubs, um, I had you for class. So when I was debating which type of methodology to use, you were helpful in that and, um, you know, and as well as your feedback. So I do appreciate all of you for that. And we can move into the, oh, most importantly, thank you to every single one of my past and present students. So no offense to all of you guys, but my past and present students, I want to give them a shout out as well. Um, and now we can move into the Q&A section, if that's okay with you, Dr. Skelton. That sounds fantastic. Well, before we um, put everybody in a waiting room, let me just explain um, what you just sat through and were able to be a part of. This is a culmination of years of work. This is not an easy process. This is probably one of the most challenging processes that um, people go through. And the percentage of people that actually graduate, um, the statistic has changed recently, but I believe it is close to 4% of the world's population are able to earn their doctorate. And so their doctorate degrees. So in looking at everything that you have just listened to, it was presented very, very professionally, very uh, comprehensively, <laughs> exhaustively. But what you understand or what I hope you take away from this is he is a master of his craft. He understands what he did. He's able to apply it. And this is um, not something that we take very lightly. And so now what we do is we professionally grill him. <laughs> And we have to lovingly put you all in the waiting room. So thank you all very much for joining in and listening to this presentation. I hope it was very informative. I hope you learned something, too. Um, I know a lot of the um, discussion had to do with some very in-depth um, research that he had conducted. But I'm sure he'll talk to each and every one of you individually if you're interested. <laughs> but what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to put you in a waiting room. So if y'all can just stand by. Um, and then, um, oh, he even wrote in the chat. Thank you, everyone. Um, and then what I'll do after uh, this discussion uh, portion, uh, I can bring everybody back. So if you just want to hang out for a little bit, that'd be great. Please, no texting him um, during this time because he will be inundated with a series of very difficult questions. I'm on do not disturb so, mode okay. anyway, so it's okay. Yes. My phone's on do not what disturb. Did you say? I'm sorry. I said my phone's on do not disturb anyway, so I wouldn't get Oh, perfect. Text. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, everyone. So I am going to um, put you all in a very lovely waiting room. Stand by. All right. I think my recording needs to. Recording go. stopped. Okay. Great presentation. Thank you. Wonderful Thank you. job. Thank you. That was really, really thorough. That was great. Um, and now we get to quiz you. <laughs> and so we're going to ask you a series of questions. And so does anybody want to go first? And yell out, go ahead. All right. Um, I have a couple of questions for you. The sure. first one is in regards to what you think should happen moving forward. Do you have steps in mind a plan perhaps to implement the better training and the resources for the current teachers in your school in relation to addressing this problem? Yes, ma'am. So I think, um, you know, technology, like we were, teachers were thrown, uh, t like technology was thrown at them pretty much. So I think providing them with more professional development on not just how to like um, deal with technology on a, like at a last minute, like type of basis, but more so long term and how to integrate it you know, when we're now back in school, more or less, that's one type of recommendation I would have for teachers. Good one. That's one that as a parent, I've been disappointed to see my younger daughter's teachers not implementing technology. She was homesick. There was no way to access the work. And I thought, well, this is crazy. You just did this for two years. Why are you not doing it? The high school level seems to be different. They seem to be embracing it and taking off with it. Do you feel there'd be a need for this study on a larger scale, such as city schools, urban schools? Do you think it's necessary? Is there a big enough problem? Absolutely. I think it shouldn't just be taking place, you know, within the United States. I think nationally it should take place um, because, you know, some areas like one thing I remember learning about from the news. So I'm sorry, it's not research based, but like there were like areas like um rural areas where they would have a bus with Wi-Fi on it and people would just kind of come to that park and, um, I think it was like South Carolina was one of the states and they would have to access their schoolwork and their online schoolwork 
in this large park where the bus was at because their individual homes did not have internet or did not have like strong enough internet capacity. So, you know, in urban, like inner city schools, there are definitely challenges, you know, socioeconomically related. So I think a case study definitely could be done, but not only for like students who were affected, but now this post COVID-19 pandemic era of children from kindergarten who ideally should be using technology all the way up to 12th grade and following a cohort or two or three, an urban, rural and suburban group um, would be beneficial as well. And we did the thing with the bus as well with Wi-Fi for certain areas here. They also had it provided at the schools so you could go sit in the parking lot. They also ended up purchasing a great deal of computers and passing them out to the kids because a lot of them didn't have computers. We were able to purchase enough that everybody had one in the household, but not everybody can do that. Do you think that would be a possibility or even realistic or even, in your opinion, useful going forward for students to be issued computers, maybe from kindergarten or first grade, that they have in their personal possession? So the school I'm working at now, Birmingham City Schools in Alabama, they did that. And they, in the beginning, they said because they had received some type of grant money, if students would break it, they would just keep on giving them a new one and a new one. And that's like, you know, when you think of Pavlov's dog, that's like not teaching them responsibility. And now when students are only issued one, it's like, uh, now I got to take care of this one device. So I think, you know... Um, I mean, this is, I, I talked to the garden for a year, so I think teaching responsibility and caring for, you know, your classroom, keeping the library clean, keeping your desk clean, that stuff that you teach at a younger age and giving the younger kids iPads and then kind of scaffolding up to laptops or Chromebooks or whatever. That's my educational opinion, not necessarily research-based, but my opinion. I was interested in your opinions. So that's what I wanted to hear. Thank <laughs> you. That's all I have for you. Thank you. Well, Raj, yeah, well, well done, Raj. I um, really you. enjoyed reading uh, your your dissertation. But a question I had, and I think they commented on this in one of your earlier drafts. You you used the word fallout. Is that synonymous with trauma? That is an excellent question. So that's something that me and Dr. Skelton were working on in the beginning. So. If, um, my understanding is, if I had used the word trauma, there would have to be several other steps that needed to take place because trauma is like a, a trigger word almost so that's but then also when you think about the COVID-19 pandemic and the fallout from it trauma is one of the fallouts there were all these other types of fallouts like the learning loss which is not I mean it could be traumatic but it's not really like a, a mental health trauma the food shortage issues and all these other issues aren't necessarily trauma but trauma is a type of fallout so in order to like obviate any issues with IRB, um, we decided to use fallout to kind of generally um, like address the research question I had. Makes sense, because the other part would have been then too, had you used that term, your your um, lit review would have been chock full of, of trauma studies, you yes. know, um, uh, and, and, and may have well had, had an impact on your design, I'm not sure. So um, one of the things that I think is interesting is, is I think for years, uh, researchers, this is just um, going to be a, 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 a resource for researchers for many years, uh, how COVID affected education. But, but we don't have the advantage of hindsight. So the question I have is, and, and uh, this is really asking your opinion more than anything, but we learned a lot. Through, through this experience. But it seems now that it's past us, that, okay, it's past us, and now we go back to the way we were. What steps would you suggest that we take in districts and in schools to, to ensure that, should something like this happen again, that we've got this wealth of information we can turn to? I think kind of like what Dr. Bianca Lab said, in terms of now that you know we're back in school, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't be using tech. Like we could still be providing homework assignments on paper as well as on like Clever or Schoology or Google Classroom, Edmodo. So I think not just saying, okay, we're done. Like I remember in my school that I worked at back in New York, the discussion was, okay, now that we're back in the classroom, some teachers said, let's just throw away the tech and now go back to paper-based worksheet teaching. And yes, those are, that's one advantage, but you know, it's like, just like with, um, 
I, I used to be a special education teacher as well. I have one of those certs. We need to kind of provide information in different modes. So yes, technology, we could also have paper-based. Like even in my classroom, which I'm in right now, I have a tech station where they do their work technologically at times. Um, they have, you know, like, like their independent station. They have like a manipulative station. So it's still important to have technology, I think, to this day. So, so there's a lesson there for us that, that really, we, we learned so much. And, and so, so my final question kind of goes along with that. So, so why do you think we reverted so much back to, to regular, um, is it because people were forced to, to do the technology or I, I guess, why didn't it take root better than it did? From my experience and from what I've seen, um, I don't know much about what the research necessarily said, but I do remember in one of the classes, um, the the veteran old guard teacher, that ideology. I think a lot of the um, teachers who want to just do things back before 2020, 2019 are teachers who are of a different era where technology wasn't used as much. I remember my first year I taught fifth grade and my two teachers, you know, that I would collaborate with, they were um, of a different generation than me. And we had a research unit. And I said, Oh, you know, we should use iPads or go to the computer lab. And they're like, No, 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 no. They said they had the units from last year, everything was printed out all the articles. And they had to create like a, um, it was, I think, an, it was like an opinion essay, I believe, where they had to like research about a topic. It was a persuasive essay, they had to write about like why cell phones should be banned from school or not be banned, or should school sports be allowed school uniforms. And I said, Why not go on Google? And like, research in that way and they were like no 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 we have everything printed so i think it's like like me i love tech i'm always using technology i started a robotics team at my school um we like we have ipads um that we're often using and you know trying to add tech in the classroom so i think it's because as we get new teachers and like i talked about the pre-service teachers providing them with educational technology like background that will be very beneficial I, I think that's that's a really interesting point that you've made, and it's one that I agree with. I think, and and, and it's not to say that that the old guard, if you will, is if there's something bad with that, but simply we are more comfortable teaching the way we were taught, and technology has really blossomed, you know, these last number of years. But um, the teaching profession as a whole, and I don't, I, this would be an interesting question. I don't know as a whole if you look across the United States what the median uh, age of an educator is, but I would suspect it's higher than we probably think, just because uh, with budget cuts and so forth, first people to go are, as you know, the, the younger teachers. So, well done, Raj. Those are all the questions I have. Thank you. So I have a few questions. Um, one of the one of, actually a statement first, um, but in looking at in in our area on the East Coast or my area, we have a, a teacher shortage. And so um, kind of, you know, debating what Dr. Rizzo was saying that, um, you know, in letting go in the past, we've had to let go people and it was, you know, first in or the, the last in is the first to go. Right. But now we're, we're so desperate for teachers. Um, you don't even need a certificate right now. You don't need a college degree. We mm -hmm. so desperately need people and we will certify you as you go type of situation. And there's a lot of criticism for this, but what it comes down to is we have so many children that we have to provide education for and our classrooms are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. One of the ways that uh, I think why this study is so important is technology could help us. Mm. And so, um, and, and real tools could be um, utilized in, in, uh, in the classroom environment. And so one of the things that you had said was just to use um, different areas of the classroom manipulatives, you know, technology, this, that, and whatever. But there's also a huge pull nowadays for people to understand that technology and games on technology are very useful tools to use. Um, and this was a big debate when I was growing up. Um, the um, Organ Trail was a video game that we used to use back in the day. And um, yeah, <laughs> Raj is like, I have no idea. And all three of us are like, you heard Oregon Trail? Oh, oh man, Julian! Oh my goodness! I heard of, like the Trail of Tears in social studies, but I don't. No, no, no! This is different. This is different. <laughs> in the aspect of technology games, but what I'm trying to to prove is that was the mentality of you know when I was when I was teaching and growing up. That's what everybody thought technology games, and now it's just so amazing, right? It's so different. 
And so in looking at this and looking at what we can implement, if you were to do a, a carry-on study, what would you do? Mm -hmm. uh, what, what, um, so you're saying, okay, so I guess... Follow-up um, study would you do? Right, so I'm thinking, I mean, following a group of K-12 students, because, you know, now a lot of them are starting to graduate, so it needs to be done, like, quickly. So I guess following a group of middle schoolers, following a group of high schoolers who were impacted by the pandemic, but then also comparing that to a group of K, like, brand new kindergartners all the way to 12, who are in a setting where they're actually using technology and they're actually doing everything that we like learned from COVID and now actually like, you know, not the teachers who are saying, let's just go backwards. The teachers who are like, okay, COVID happened. Now this is what I can do differently in my classroom. Following a group of that, those kinds of students and seeing the, you know, academic effects um, on those types of students. And that's wonderful. And, and to follow up with, um, what we were talking about before and we had discussed the fact that giving out computers right in different counties and how everybody has handled that and you had made the point of saying you know if a computer is given out saying it'll be replaced every time we have a problem but giving out a computer was trying to help solve a problem and so what we noticed with this initial immersion of, of using giving out computers to kids is you're giving out computers to kids mm -hmm. And so if you, if you expect them to charge a computer every night, it's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. you know, They'll charge you their cell phones, to, but not their computers. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> if you expect them to bring a charger every day, it's not going to happen, right? You know, these kinds of things. But um, I think that had to do so, with, like, what I was saying about there was no standard, and a lot of the participants were talking about that. Like, so what, like, we know what the consequences is if you don't bring your, your, your book for ELA class, or what if you don't bring your math homework. But what is the consequence when you don't bring your iPad? Because if we're going to use iPads today, you know, it's not like, you know, oh, okay, you didn't do your homework, now come and sit with me during lunch. What do we do? Because we don't have extra iPads now sitting in the classroom if everyone was issued one. So that's definitely some of the stuff that was discussed in the interviews. But that, that was my you know, question. What is that standard? Mm -hmm. What, you know, could you do a study based on that standard? I think, well? I, I don't think so. I think the study or the, the first thing that needs to be done is creating a standard. And then we could do a study. Are those standards like effective? Do they need to be changed? Um, so first the standards need to be created. And I think that needs to happen from like nationally, not, I don't know, or it could be done through research. And then we need to research if those standards are appropriate and effective or not. And what we need to change. And then the last thing is, you know, in, in looking at paying it forward and, and hopefully helping other people go through this process, um, what would be the best piece of advice from start to finish for you to give um, maybe a very younger version of Raj coming through? Make sure that you're researching a topic that you're really like passionate about and that's applicable to you. Because if it's applicable to you, then you're going to be more interested in it. Yeah. I like that. All right. Well, that's all the, the questions that I had. So um, with everybody's permission, may I please kick Raj out? Yes. <laughs> Did you like that? That was fancy. All right. Raj, I'm putting you in a holding pin, so don't go anywhere. <laughs> Hello and welcome, everyone. Raj, you are muted, just so you know. Oh, thank you. Here we go. All right, so everyone, thank you for sticking around. I am, I am impressed. That was a long time to wait, but we're very grateful you did. At this point in time, what we do is we um, discuss what we had um, discussed previously. And so what we were able to do is come to an understanding of everything that he had gone through, and we quizzed him. We grilled him, so to speak, not only on his content, but also his philosophy and so, like we said, this is very, very difficult to even get to this stage, let alone go past this stage. Most people have to carry on and do this again. But I'm happy to announce that Raj does not. You have officially passed your oral defense. So congratulations. You are one step closer to being Dr. Verma. And that will come after you fill out some final paperwork. So we would just like to collectively say congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Well done. Thank Congrats! You. Thank you. <laughs> Everybody can take their, the, their selves off and mute. Um, but he does have a request. Thank you. Thank Congratulations. you. Congratulations, Yay. Mr. Barmer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. His request is that everybody turn on your camera. He is going to take a picture of everybody oh. that attended. <laughs> 
So if you could move yourselves a little bit towards the camera so we can see you. He's going to take Can you make me a host real quick, Dr. Skelton? Oh, yes, you need host yeah. privileges. All the privileges. All right, host. Take it away. Awesome. My father's taking time turning it on. Oh, we got two more people. All right, we got one more person. No, I guess not. Okay. On three, ready? <laughs> one. There's someone else count. Can you count, Doc? One. One, two, three. Awesome. I got it. Thank you. And I even heard it. That was great. Oh. <laughs> awesome. Everybody, huge congratulations to Raj. Thank this you. was not an easy task. But with this said and done, everybody have a wonderful day, a blessed season, and congratulations yet again. Thank you. Congratulations, Raj. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for coming, everyone. Congratulations. Thank you.